Latorche, France, April 1984. The world's best board sailors gather here to take part in the first competitive series of the Windsurfing World Cup 1984. Board sailing, sometimes called windsurfing, is one of the fastest growing sports in the world. Although it first started in the United States in 1967, the spectacular growth started during the mid-70s in Europe. Today, there are more than 5 million people worldwide for whom the number one summer sport is having fun with a board and sail. It was in 1984 in Los Angeles that board sailing first entered the ranks as an Olympic sport. The board sailing industry has grown along with the sport. Early in 1983, a group of internationally known firms, sailmakers, and board manufacturers founded the World Sailboard Manufacturers Association, WSMA. The purpose of the association, also known as the WSMA Board Sailing Pool, is to promote the growth of board sailing sport on a worldwide basis, in particular through spectacular regattas with top performers. The World Cup was launched in 1983 to carry out this objective. As with Alpine skiers and Formula One cars, competitors participate within a series format. Winner of the very first WSMA World Cup was the 22-year-old American Robbie Nash, who had already won his first world title when he was only 13 years old. And here in Latorche, we'll see what chance he has to retain his World Cup title. WSMA regattas are held for fun boards only. In other words, for boards and sails which are designed to meet the toughest demands of stormy winds and waves. For the competitors, regattas under these conditions require high standards of fitness, physical skills, sailing ability, and tactics. For spectators and the media, regattas under these conditions embody the most spectacular forms of board sailing. In addition, they enable manufacturers to put prototypes of potential series models through the hardest test trials imaginable. Wind and wave conditions permitting, three forms of board sailing competition are held in each World Cup regatta. Course racing, slalom, and wave riding. From the resulting ranking lists for the individual disciplines, the specialist champions are established. Those who perform the best in all the three disciplines may then call themselves overall world champion. In La Torche, course racing is the first discipline. It takes place on a circular course with only a short close reach, but a long wind beam or reach course. All competitors begin each race in a massed start on the water. The total number of races in this discipline in each regatta is between three and six. In this race, the Dane Tim Augustin is in the lead, followed closely by two West Germans Jürgen Schroeder and Jürgen Hunscheid. Last year in the first WSMA World Cup series, Hunscheid stood a very good chance of winning the world title, but had to retire prematurely when he awkwardly fell after a meters high jump over the waves during a training session and broke a number of vertebrae in his neck. According to the doctors, it was a miracle that he survived the accident, but nevertheless, he's here again for this season. Most sections of the race are concerned with pure speed and by the marker boys, it's a question of skill. One wrong move and the board sailors can be suddenly lying in the water. Tim Augustin wins this race. But in the total course racing discipline of the World Cup in La Torche, Tim takes third place behind Bjorn Schroeder and Arno Tillier. La Torche is a small village on the northwest coast of France, situated at the furthermost point of the western part of Brittany, lying at least 500 kilometers from Paris. However, despite the fact that it is so remote, in 1983 there were 50,000 spectators, which this year should easily be more than doubled. In total, at least 
130,000 spectators will follow the events, which are spread over 12 days. Intense press coverage can also be expected. After a few unsuccessful days waiting in vain for a decent wind, a start was made on the following discipline, the slalom, which flagged off on the beach with the so-called Le Mans start. The slalom is held in the surf, thus making it easy for the public to follow in a knockout format. Competitors start in groups comprising eight individuals and the rest go through into the next round until the finals. The course may be varied depending on local conditions. In slalom, the competitors use small boards. These are called sinkers because without sufficient wind, they actually sink, sailor and all. That is also the reason for this kind of surfing competition that a minimum wind speed is prescribed in the rule book. Obviously, this varies with each discipline, but it averages out at about 14 knots, which is roughly force four on the Beaufort scale. To everyone's great surprise, an unknown Frenchman, Robert Territio, wins the semi-final of the slalom from the favorite Robbie Nash. This was, of course, greeted with enormous enthusiasm from the French public. We're certainly going to hear more about Territio in the course of this World Cup season, but it's Robbie Nash, here at the start of the finals, who gets a flying start and claims victory in the slalom for himself. But the champagne goes deservedly to the Dane Tim Augustin, who surprisingly claimed the overall lead in the La Torche World Cup, albeit with just one point more than his teammate Robbie Nash. The opening of the windsurfing World Cup is over. The main part of it is passed. It wasn't possible in La Torche to complete the third discipline, the wave performance, where a jury judges various maneuvers in the surf. Unfortunately, lack of wind resulted in this discipline being called off. Each World Cup lasts around 10 days, and it always depends on the wind as to whether which disciplines can be sailed. Under ideal conditions, it's possible to complete all three, but that seldom happens. This is really inherent to the nature of windsurfing, and participants, public and organizers alike, all take this into consideration. In La Torche, the boards are loaded up once again. The participants can prepare themselves for the next regatta, on to the next location, wherever the wind blows.
after San Francisco, it's the turn of Hawaii, home waters for Robbie Nash, who in the meantime has taken the overall lead after the San Francisco World Cup. Moreover, for the first time in San Francisco, women started in a separate category. And in Hawaii, they will demonstrate that they have more than earned a place in the WSMA World Cup. It was a fine demonstration which proved that performance and grace are a perfect combination. The World Cup in Hawaii also enabled it justifiably to be catapulted to the status of the mecca of windsurfing. Almost nowhere else in the world could you ever find such an ideal combination of wind and waves. A combination that makes windsurfing so fascinating. A natural challenge for competitors and equipment alike. In September, after the WSMA had prolonged its World Cup circuit in the West German Sult, the board sailing pool then put up its tents on the promenade of the Dutch seaside resort Scaveningen. Here, the Dutchman Stefan van den Berg prepares himself for the start of the first race. In Los Angeles, he won the Olympic gold medal, but now he has definitely said goodbye to his amateur status and has joined the ranks of the professionals in order to test his skills against artists such as Robbie Nash, who in the meantime has already built up a comfortable lead in this year's ranking list. In the pits, which the teams have made room for on the promenade, the participants are busy with preparations for this penultimate World Cup regatta. Every manufacturer affiliated with the WSMA has the right to enter one team in the World Cup. The costs of a top team could very easily be called steep and comprise not only salaries, premiums and travel expenses for the surfers, but also material costs, which for a great part, come from manufacturers' research budgets. Because the Windsurfing World Cup, just as in Formula One car racing, contributes much to the development of ordinary sailboards and surfing sails for the consumer. All special events are financed by sponsors who sometimes, as is the case here in Holland, put a complete service team on the water. The start of the course racing, which took place in Scaveningen under constantly differing conditions. Nash was once again in a class of his own, 
But for Steven van den Berg and his fans, there was a pleasant surprise. Appearing for almost the first time as a professional in this category, Steven finished in third place. Partly due to the wind, which there was constantly enough of, the Skavening in competition was a resounding success. Indeed, equaling the success of the previous year, the Windsurfing World Cup attracted more than 200,000 spectators and therefore was one of the biggest sporting events ever to be held in Holland. A truly spectacular happening was presented to the spectators, like here in the slalom. Once more, Nash won the event with Panache, but there was also enormous admiration for Stefan van den Berg, who, despite the fact that he was swept off his board by the enormous waves, succeeded in reaching the finals. The finals in which, for a long time, Kurt Larned held the lead, but which he finally had to relinquish to the professionalism of Nash. The women competitors also performed fantastically under these difficult conditions. The American Jenna de Rosnay won this stage, while the debutante Dutch girl Martina van Solingen came second. She was also delighted with her fine performance. day and still the wind held up for the very first time during this season's World Cup regatta all three disciplines can be completed today it's the turn of the wave performance Stefan van den Berg is first to break the ice so to speak and despite the fact that he more than anyone has to get used to this World Cup discipline he doesn't do badly at all during the wave discipline the jury are looking at the patterns made by the competitors in the surf Windsurfing is staged in a knockout format, similar to that used for slalom, and is also sailed with small boards. Unlike the slalom and course racing, the winner is not the surfer who finishes first. Wave riding is a free form for fun board surfers. Within a short period of time, usually about 10 minutes, the participants must show their skill in the surf. A jury evaluates the quality of jumps, wave riding, and maneuvering. One of the biggest discoveries of this World Cup was Dutch-born Björn Dunkerbeck, appearing for Spain. At 15 years old, he was the youngest competitor. As the winner of the Euro Fun Board Cup held annually under the auspices of the WSMA, he qualified to take part with the professionals. He gave a star quality performance, and as a result is now being tipped as a possible successor to Robbie Nash 
who at the start of the wave performance set a blustering pace. Without any effort at all, he jumped into the finals where he came up against his friend and teammate Pete Cabrinha. Despite the fact that this is his favorite discipline, he was beaten in the earlier World Cup in Sult in West Germany. Will he do better this time? public saw a breathtaking spectacle, which reached a fantastic high point with something that's never before been seen in Europe, a salto. An incredible performance from Nash, which gave him the lead in this event as well, and which shows that the limits of board sailing are constantly being stretched. Japan, the land of the rising sun, is where we find the finals of the 1984 WSMA Windsurfing World Cup. Participants are treated to a welcoming party, and some of them are clearly having difficulty with Japanese eating customs. sailing is rapidly gaining enormous popularity in Japan and the arrival of the windsurfing World Cup circus certainly gives an extra incentive for further development of the sport. Just like elsewhere in the world, the contest attracts many spectators, especially in the weekends. Naturally, the sponsors are very pleased and in the meantime, spectators and participants alike get ready for the big final. Thankfully here in Omiyazaki, the wind's also very favorable. There are enormous waves, but on the shore, the wind makes life uncomfortable now and again. At the skipper's meeting, last details are given concerning wind and course. The slalom is the first event on the program. The wind blows constantly, very hard, sometimes more than 50 knots. 
which is 8 to 9 on the Beaufort scale, and the waves are so strong that the boys have to be put into position by helicopters. Then, the spectacle can start. Japanese television covered the event live, which you can now enjoy with us. For those for whom it was not altogether clear, it looked as though the heat would be between the American Alex Aguera and the Frenchman Robert Territiot who not only had their hands full battling it out between themselves, but also had to contend with the elements. The smallest mistake is immediately punished, as Alex Aguera discovered here. Territio has his golden opportunity and seizes it. With his extra small sail, perhaps handkerchief would be a better word, it looks as though he's made the right choice. Flat out, Territio rounds the boy near the beach. The surfers have to twice navigate the figure of eight course, round two boys, and finish at the beach. Territio's lead over Aguera is impressive. From the other participants in the heat, six in all, there's already nothing to be seen. Your fellow competitors are traveling so fast that should you fall, then immediately you lose hundreds of meters. Nevertheless, a fall can happen just like that, and that's precisely what can happen to Terithio. He's already passed the next boy and is approaching the beach at enormous speed. In fact, he's traveling so fast before the wind that he even overtakes the waves, and that can be dangerous. He has to jump over the crest of the waves, thereby losing his balance. He falls, and is immediately engulfed by the self-same wave. But Aguera is also in difficulty, and he too is forced to make an emergency jump, but unfortunately loses his balance. Meanwhile, Toritio has recovered and reaches the beach first, where the following participants are already waiting. The wind is still blowing hard, as the heat with, among others, Stephen van der Berg and Ken Winner is about to start. Ken Winner is one of the few who could threaten Robbie Nash's ambitions to retain his world title. The surfers race over the water at an incredible speed. They're traveling faster than many a speedboat, and most of the time only the back of the board is in contact with the water. The fins ensure course stability. 
The jumps are the most dangerous maneuvers since you can not only lose your balance while in the air, but you also lose speed. To avoid any possible danger, everyone gives the boy a wide round. No matter, while jiving, one after the other takes a tumble. Ken Winner is the first to recover and goes into a considerable lead, guaranteeing himself a place in the finals. How's it going with Nash? Despite the fact that he's had to work hard for it, he too manages to reach the finals. Almost immediately, Robbie Nash takes an unfortunate wave badly and falls. The French talent, Robert Territio, goes into a surprising lead, followed by Ken Winner and Peter Cabrinha with Nash following fourth position. But just what can he do? Ken Winner looks as though he's going to be first round the boy, but Territio slips masterfully in between. to his larger sail is much faster and again takes the lead. But Nash has definitely now taken up the chase. again first by the furthermost boy but loses his balance and again Terithio slips through. Nash too takes advantage of winner's mistake but will be able to overhaul the Frenchman. But Terithio smells the sweet set of success and is determined to maintain his lead.
just before the finish, he laps a tail ender. And indeed, it's Derithio who reaches the beach first and wins this sensational slalom final. Robbie Nash can also be pleased with his fantastic overtaking. In Omiyazaki, the surfers are getting ready for the next discipline, course racing. Here too, Nash wins again and is assured of retaining his world title, but he still keeps himself in trim for the third discipline, the wave performance. The wind is now completely dropped and the Japanese fishing boats can finally be put to sea. In the dunes, the sand has settled down a little. There's still some surf, but the wind isn't strong enough to continue racing. For the participants, it's time to think about other things, about home, for instance. Some of them make a virtue of necessity. Others use the enforced rest period to repair their equipment, which by now has taken quite a pounding. Nash is very relaxed and concentrates on other things, but Ken Winner isn't pleased at all. The wind meter isn't anywhere near the point where it's possible to surf. Time, therefore, to put aside wishes and dreams. In order to let off a bit of steam, a stiff tug of war is organized. the meteorologist still offers some hope. The wind is picking up.
The spectators take their places and the women prepare for the wave performance. The photographers go wild. That's obvious. Conditions are not ideal, and the wind drops again. The men's wave performance is cancelled. The women, however, complete their event. Sean O'Neill takes the first place, but her compatriot Julie DeWord wins this last World Cup, as does Robbie Nash. A double victory for the Americans. And the final placings look like this. Natalie Lelievre from France and Robbie Nash are the 84 World Cup winners. Julie DeWord and Ken Winner, both from the United States, take second place. And Canadian Annie Graveline ends a third, just like Robert de Ridio. Thank you.